Texas uh, managing partner of high Brigade Strawberries. He is located in New York, a Wall Street office. The, another means he is managing all our financial related services practices around the world. So he joined the research industry. He has a, such a, a strong interest in his business. So right after he graduated, undergraduate from Columbia University, majored in economics, and he joined the search industry. So ever since he joined <coughs> this industry, he's been doing this business more than a decade. So I asked today how many people he placed by now. He probably uh, more than 500 people uh, from the around the world. Because he started business in Korea, and he used to himself in Hong Kong, and London, and New York. It means he placed a very different kind of executives uh, in a various uh, companies. So he has a very experience in this business as well as in this market. So as you may see, he just uh, you know, come out. He also used to be a football player as well. So he is such an energetic person. So please uh, welcome John Kim.
climate is a global basis. You have to really leverage the global climate goal to be more competitive and highly efficient organization. Create that and groom the future leaders. Why are we looking at this war for talent? A lot of people talk about it. I'm sure many of them have read it. I certainly have read it from a McKenzie study to a lot of different studies that really pointing out this issue that we're facing. I like to highlight one or two main themes why we're facing this in a little bit different angle. The first reason why we're looking at this problem today is because aging population in developed countries. What does that mean? As you can see on the slide, basically the population of the working force in developed countries, what we call Western world, is small, getting smaller. By 2011, 50% of the workforce of the Western world will be over 50. By 2018, 80% of the workforce in Western world will be over 50. That means 80% 80, 80 working population by 2018 in Western world will be out, will be kind of following the retirement trust. In the U.S., 75 million people are approaching retirement. Only 30 million members of the Generation X, what we call, are available as successors. In 2006 alone, in the U.S., the trend is very evident. It started building. Two workers left workforce for every one that has entered. So obviously you can see that workforce base is getting smaller in the U.S. In Europe, it's an almost the same story. In the European Union, the working age population forecast to fall by 48 million, or 16 percent by 2050. This is a graph that uh, I just want to use to give you some visual of uh, aging population that is really happening. This is a chart that shows that by 2025, age range over 65 or plus a percentage of that, their population to the total population of their country. Obviously, darker blue represent the higher percentage compared to the lot, you know, lighter blue. And you can easily see that all the developing countries, the trend is happening. Another slide to show you a little bit more visual on the working population basis. And this captures five different kind of years looking, looking forward. And you will see that developed countries like Germany, uh, Japan, U.S., they're sitting, you know, the bars are a lot lower than the countries like uh, you know, South Korea and other, other developing countries in terms of comparing the number of work, working population that we're looking at in the, in the next 25 years. Another reason that we are looking at this problem today is because rising demand for climate in what we call rapid developing economies. And he said, why is that a problem? Because it used to be developed nations like the United States and the United Kingdom, when they need more skilled labor force, they used to turn to developing countries to subsidize them. So for example, we have seen the trend in IT engineering and pharmaceutical industries where the United States, if there is more workforce needed, they easily turn into Singapore, India, or Hong Kong, where English-speaking developing nations had to supply those demand. But that's not happening anymore. Because all these rapidly developing <coughs> economies actually need the workforces themselves. So basically, instead of even for them, they are also looking at talents within their local markets, but also now they have to reach out to developing nations to bring more talents to their, to their local markets. What's going to happen and create this thing is that basically all those rapid developing economies are not just going to sit back and lose the talent they're supposed to be maintaining within their own local markets. As you can see, more than 50% of the employers in five of the eight countries in the Asia Pacific region reported difficulty finding suitable talent for available positions within their market. Uh, the graph on the left side represents the countries 
of those that are most difficult finding the right people. And then on the right side is where it shows the least difficult countries that to find people. <coughs> this is another graph that I want to just add in and show it to you because and if this is a very simple logic. If the economy is growing fast, then you need more people fast enough to keep up that pace. And as you can tell, China and Asia, ex Japan, they are growing faster than every other, the rest of the world. So, which means that Asia represents what we call rapid developing economies, will be needing more people just by a sure number of how they are quickly growing. Another interesting factor that I would like to point out to you all is there is a changing in demographics in terms of workforce when you look at it. China produces university graduates each year. That is more than the United States, Japan and France, France all combined. About 97% of 438 million people joining the workforce by 2050 will come from developing countries. By 2050, the workforce in developed countries will have shrunk by 11 million, while the workforce in the emerging economies will have grown by 1.7 billion. Another interesting fact, Indian graduates work 24% more hours a year than their counterparts in the U.S. And I think it's an interesting factor since I'm speaking Korean. South Korea actually has the same number of engineering graduates as the United States, despite having only one-sixth of population as a quarter country in comparison. Now, those two factors combined, what I call, we can all predict that there's a perfect storm brewing. We know something's going to happen when you look at all this kind of imbalanced demand and supply equation with all those factors, how people, the population base is changing. United, European Union needs 76 to 105 million people to meet this deficit. U.S. needs 32 to 48 million people, more people, to keep up their talent base and workforce going. But as I said, the developing countries are also need those talent as well. And those developing countries, I can assure you that if I go to Singapore, not even, you know, if we look at China and India, they all have a plan to recruit labor and leadership from developed countries and actually import them to fill their skill positions. What's going to happen to all this thing when you look at global workforce? Whether it's developed countries or developing countries, we're going to see a bigger mix of age, gender, race, and based on regions being the people coming from different countries using different languages will be more complex. And as human resource management executives, we all have to face, or you all have to face, how to deal with this issue moving forward. Now we define kind of the problem that we're facing today. So I'd like to kind of give you a little bit more data points on what those problems are causing and how the talent is moving around globally. When we look at the global talent movement, one thing that comes to it my mind, and I just want to point out to you, is the concept of a global citizen. More and more people, when you look at it, they're really with the one passport that represent the country, but really when you look at ask them, they were born in country X, they were educated country Y, and they're working in country Z, and they have a plan to move around and cover another three other countries because of their need of what they can provide to a workforce. So, we, you know, based on those trends that we're looking at, dual citizenship it will be becoming more increasingly popular. And that's why, that's because countries start aggressively going after those talent on global basis in terms of their, their local markets. Another concept that I'd like to point out to you is that shift on the way from brain drain to brain circulation around the world. Once again, this is what I was talking about just going back. When, when I say brain drain, it's basically, it has been one main street of, for example, Asia, the 
developing colonies, providing both talent and supplying both talent to the developed nations. So we see even in Korea, a lot of people or used to see a lot of people moving moving to United States or even United Kingdom where to find a better jobs or you know skilled patients needing those countries are forcing the top workforce in Korea to really immigrate to those countries. When you go it was really one way state. There was the trend in the past, but not anymore. I know for a fact that even my trip here, a lot of companies, a lot of multinational Korean companies are wanting those people back. Whether they're Korean or foreigners, the need for those skilled workforce is a lot higher than before. And that's a trend we will see, and that's creating a two-way street now instead of just one-way street. And we call that brain circulation. There was two examples I just put on there. I mean, you know, basically, there's many of the projects that we're working on right now as high nutrient robots as a firm. We're moving a lot of people across the globe. I mean, it's very evident to us. The reason I put those just those two cases, they represent something very unique and, you know, which we have seen, uh, we have not seen a lot in the body even five years ago. We have seen a lot of Hong Kong and Singapore based people moving to Western world, by American Kingdom or Sweden. But recently the ratio has been shifted. We see 50% of all the work projects that we are working on actually is people coming into Asia from the Western countries. So I thought it was interesting for me to point out to you. One thing when we talk about talent movements, the first vocabulary that comes to everyone's mind is expatriate. Now, in Korea, we, we see a lot of expatriates coming in from their home countries and banning the business in Korea. But one thing that I think you know people just kind of ignore is that not really taking the time to understand what those expatriates really mean with some detailed data to understand them a little better. 19% of the expatriates are actually females. 50% of expatriates are between age range 20 to 39. 60% of expatriates are married. 51% of expatriates are actually accompanying their children. 83% of expatriates actually accompany their wife or spouses or partners. 56% of the experience are actually relocated from their home country. As this data stand alone, it doesn't really mean anything. But if you or your company is trying to hire expatriates from, uh, you know, bring expatriates from other nations and trying to create a workforce based on that, this is very, very critical information. Because when you recruit someone, as you all know, the first thing they gotta do is, if you're male, ask your wife, okay? And the second, and another, another thing that I think is very important is the child education. There's a lot of difficulties that associate with moving expatriates around. Two factors here. Still, the United States, China, and United Kingdom were the three most frequent locations that expatriates are, assignments are coming out. And China, India, and Russia were the, were the primary emerging destinations for them. As I said, the difficulty of moving people around and difficulties associated with experiences. The first one is expense. Sending a one expiritual person to the to the country from the home country can cost three to four times their home country salaries. On top of that, there's housing, education, there's a lot of hurt that comes with it actually make experience a very, very expensive proposition when it comes to resolving a talent issue. On top of that, because they are married and they're, they have kids, it's a serious adjustment for those families that have to come with it. Now, the third part, third point on the, on the slide is difficulty in recovering the investment that you go putting into those experiences. Why is that? Because there's a one, actually data comes out and put it in here, but uh, almost 29% of expats that come back from their foreign assignments leave company within a year. So basically what company did was they sent over, sent, sent them over to the overseas for three years with all those perks and expensive investment. Coming back less than a year, they're gone. They left the company. 
So basically, that's, that's, uh, that's some serious issue there that you have to manage. The fourth point, human resource challenges. Expats abroad, there is almost doubling up the headcounts to cover them from a head headquarters to the local locations they are actually located at. So almost the um, administration support, meaning that uh, it could be anywhere from IT technology support to uh, you know uh, executive assistant support. A lot of things are really doubling up on what they are doing. Finally, business difficulties. I know that we actually have been out on a, abroad on any assignments. You know, although you can be educated, getting prepared before you get there, until you actually get there, a lot of things are very hard to understand and find out. Once you get there, I'm sure there's policies in every country, cultures that you haven't, you you thought you knew, but when you actually live in there, and on top of that, trying to generate revenue to make money for your company, things are not that easy. One of the executive, um, human resource executive, the Arnstein Young said this I thought very, very well, to actually give you some idea to think about how to win the mobility, meaning that how to make this more successful. To win the mobility battle, a company has to demonstrate consistently that people who are willing to work abroad can jump stage their careers. What does that mean? I mean, this means, actually what he's trying to say here, actually his hit. This person trying to say is that there has to be a continuum in the career progression when you actually send someone outside of your home country one of foreign assignments. It's very, very critical for them to provide a future progression of their career path instead of just sending them with some other assignments that is good for the company. You really have to think about what is good for them. And every success that you see in a failure there has been well planned out progression that is supporting the case. Now, now I'm going to spend some time moving into talking about actually talent acquisition and making a strategy itself. Talent acquisition. Global talent management and acquisition is actually it's a weird problem. And it is a very serious problem for a lot of multinational companies. And I don't think it's anything different for any Korean companies that exist in today. It's the competitive advantage that you have to be created. At the end of the day, the work is done by people. You can have the best systems, you can have the best buildings, you can have the best support, whatever you can get. But at the end of the day, it's your employees who is going to make the difference. It's a huge, you know, a lot of companies are under huge pressure. My competitors who cut the operating cost, minimize labor costs by moving jobs into American markets, and to diversify and tap the international workforce. Also, you, the workforce you're facing today, actually I'm going to spend some time in the later slides, but they represent today actually four different generations in one. And you really have to understand what that means to you, and how you're going to manage those four different generations. So, a generation still gets between largely to the mass of retiring baby boomers, as I said, aging population, is forcing company to view the talent acquisition as organizational priority. When you look at the trend in the last 10 years of how these companies has been, and as the economy is growing rapidly, and as companies are expanding rapidly, external recruitment and search activity has increased tremendously. There's limited, however, there's limited global evidence that talent identification, acquisition and retention, development or leverage is taking a place in a disciplined manner, manner. Which means that a lot of companies talk about this issue, a lot of companies want to do well, but actually we haven't found many people have a plan that in place that's going to make the difference for your future, company's future success. Now, I thought this is an interesting time to look at best in class. We talk about best in class in a lot of things. And this is a survey done by a Auburn group that actually asked a lot of senior executives and identified who's actually doing well in this talent movement and talent acquisition actually. And 
we did, in a survey came out. Among those best-in-class companies, top strategic actions they take to be the best-in-class. 54% said they are proactively searching for and communicating with the desired candidates. I'm going to come back to this topic, but this is what we call proactive HR management. You're not sitting there thinking, we're going to react when things happen. You have to proactively manage your time and places. You have to continuously find who's going to sue for your company and how you're going to, how you're going to attract them. And sometimes it takes more than a couple of conversations. Sometimes it takes a couple of years. We have to stay on top of that, communicate and proactively have that communication roots that is going to open up the conversations later. 31% of the best in class said that create a data repository of desired and active and passive candidates, meaning that, once again, they track what they want to hire. They track the people, and if, even if it's not today, they, will, they have a database to go back to for future. 30% of them said assess candidates for skills, attitudes, or motivation all in the hiring process, meaning that they do have a more thorough hiring process that involves not only, look, I'm looking for an IT manager, five years we experience looking at software as well as hardware. There's more to it than that. You got to really check the attitude, motivation, wanting that, knowing the cushion, the pull factors to make your hiring more successful. 28% of best in class emphasize strategic and long-term workforce planning. We're going to spend a little more time on this a little later because many people say, and there's, this is kind of maybe a very financial services Wall Street saying, money is, not every, money is not always everything, but money is everything. But guess what? That's changing too. Because a lot of successful companies in hiring, actually, the compensation is a very small portion of employees' concern. So we'll come back to this though. It's funny that I say this because I mean, I suppose telling the market that we should keep acquiring people. As a search person, that's our business. But to be bluntly honest, many of the talent that you have today is, is as important, if not more important, than actually just keep recruiting people from outside. Successful organizations of the future will not just attract the brightest talent, but knows how to nurture and develop and retain it. That's the key to success. When you read McKinsey, this McKinsey, McKinsey study has done back in 2006. McKinsey has key obstacles that raised by 50 of CEOs across 29 global organizations when it comes to being the barriers to you know, having an effective talent management. 54% said senior managers don't spend enough time, <coughs> high quality time, on talent management. Basically, senior management of their companies say yes when the meeting happens, say yes on the conference call, but not, they're not really spending their time with their, their people, their team, team members to really understand how to manage them. 52% said line manager are not sufficiently committed to the people development. Guess what? 52 people out of 100 people that you have in your company is thinking about themselves first instead of developing others. And 51% said organization is siloed and does not encourage collaboration or sharing resources. Meaning that out of let's say 10,000 employees that you may have as a company, fully leveraged workforce usually is 60 to 65%. That's where you're, make, you're actually losing money. When you pull that up to 80% level, your company will double in every way as a revenue or efficiency in the company. Let's talk about talent management 101, what we have to do. Talent management must become a core activity on a par with corporate finance and strategic planning. So when you look at kind of organizations in the past, under CEO, there's a huge finance and accounting division. And usually led by a person called CFO. And there's a huge probably IT division, which is led by a person called CI. There's another C that you have to remember now called CHRO. It's called Chief Human Resource Officer. 
I've seen that many companies in the last five years, actually in the States, that they have created this job and put an emphasis by putting them on an executive committee of all the other C-level people and actually report directly to CEO. That wasn't the trend at all in the past. The trend used to be that all the high official HR people used to report to what we call CEOs, chief operating officers. But guess what? The emphasis has shifted. And that's how much of the a lot of people are putting on in state. Talent must be managed rigorously and globally. It's not a one-time thing. You holding a conference internally <coughs> once a year is not going to really help you to manage your time on an ongoing basis. Having said that, this has to be a long-term plan. You've got to have at least a three-year, if not ten-year outlook of how you're going to actually manage your time. I, I put down four points here for as a suggestion. And I think, you know, based on my experience, these were the four things that actually made a difference in talent management for a lot of companies out there. First thing that when we go in front of CEOs and talk about the talent management, we actually ask a question. Do you have a global model where you actually address and manage talent? You know, until a couple of years ago, the answer was usually no. Or they said, what do you mean by that? Well, we have an HR process, we have a recruiting process, we have job specs, so, but isn't that an option? Now, people are actually coming to us and telling us, hey, here's a kind of two-page on talent management. This is a model we have. And the key point here is that it's not just a model for one nation. It's a global plan, how they're going to move the resources around. Second one is elevate global talent planning as a top item for CEO's agenda. Even in a lot of Western multinational companies, a lot of decisions don't get made unless it's on top of CEO's mind. Actually, people have to tell them that you should lose sleep over this, then they start to think about it. And basically, right now, a lot of people are putting this emphasis by making a lot, a lot of CEO's number one priority. Expanding the hiring horizon. What I mean by that is that at the end of the day, when you look at the skilled labor force or unskilled labor force that you have, you have to manage, the trick is how you mix it. It's, it's a combination of, let's say, how many newcomers you, you, know, you recruit from the college versus how many you know, experienced workers you're going to recruit this year from outside. There has to be an art of science behind it of mixing those workforces or talent pool that you're going to look at. Finally, on this topic, Actually, this is a, kind of interesting thing, because I, when I was in Tokyo, this was, a, this was kind of something that, the, as a concept that Japanese still don't understand. It's called the importance of succession. Now, when we talk about succession in the United States, people only think about succession to their CEO. And actually, some CEOs say, I'm healthy, I just got the job, I plan to be here for the next five years, so I don't need a successor. Hmm, okay, that's one point. But there's a lot of wise CEOs out there who are saying, okay, look, I'm doing a job that is very difficult. I'm managing a lot of big companies. Guess what? Even if I'm going to be here for five years, I need my successor today so that they can be nurtured, developed, and trained actually on the job to be a better CEO than I am. That's a company actually, you know what, you should buy stock in. Because they're going to be there five years, better in a better shape than today. And this succession plan actually, <clears throat> when you look at the trend today, it's hitting, <coughs> excuse me, it's hitting every level. It's not just CEOs, the next C-suites, all the executive directors, directors, even down to the <coughs> very junior member of your of, uh, of a business unit, there is a lot of succession planning going on. Because every time you lose a person, or you can promote a person, you don't want to be reactive, as I said before. You want to be proactive, meaning that you should have a plan to replace that account so, so that the machine doesn't stop today. It's going to continue to go on. A few other additional points I want to just point out to that is very important for talent management. Accel accelerate the careers and create a global leaders. As I said, money alone is often sufficient enough to keep the best employees around. Money is important. Money is a key factor, but money isn't everything. 
combination of compensation and carryover opportunities and a good working environment can actually really retain the best talent. International rotation are a key part of career and leadership development programs, offering high potential candidates in, recent, in rapidly developing economies have the chance to expose the global culture and business practices. Now, when, look at that statement for a second. High potential employees in the headquarters actually get all attention. But your, your company, if you're multinational, you have a lot more offices than the one just you have installed. I'm sure you have factories out if you're manufacturing outside salt. You may have a rap office in Hong Kong. You may hire somebody that, as a CEO or an HR executive, you kind of know by name, but doesn't understand the potential. This is time for you to get to know the stars in every office, stars in every location. They share the same business card. If they are the ones who actually can be the diamond and doesn't, and can actually make the difference. Another point. Well, ensure all the leaders to embrace the global mindset. I think uh, it must be more than actually 10 years, maybe it could be 15 years. And um, I heard a link called globalization, Segeva in Korea. I'm not sure what that means actually, because uh, I think a lot of things have changed. And I understand Korea as a country is becoming global. But when you actually see it, when I actually go and meet the companies, they know how to now study, they know how to write it, but I don't think they have actually game plan to be one. That training starts today, and actually with a lot of investment going into turning your leadership team and actually help them to start to think a lot and have that global mindset. That doesn't happen overnight, and it's not just one single, as I said, you know, meetings or conference calls. There has to be a plan of that. The final point is that Actually, as a company, when you reinvest in people, which we all say we do as a company, it's really critical now to looking at this, this war for talent that you have to do the better job reskilling and upskilling your talents. Talent choice will mean giving careful and timely thoughts to how you're going to actually do that. And actually, how you're going to create the walls to do that, how you're going to create the systems to do that. And once again, with the global mindset in your mind, any existing or traditional trading methodology should be revisited so that it suits what it has to become. Here's a quick kind of a circular talk. Actually, what's on there is important, but I just want to give you a visual. It's a circular thing. It's a continuum. It's not a one straight line where you have a starting point and end point. And if you spend, as an executive, spending six months with the employee and say, we finished our trading session, here's a diploma, that doesn't mean it ends. It's a continuum cycle. Continues to, you have to stay on top of the bottom end. <laughs> How do you get actually develop what we call global talent index? This is done alongside with the economic intelligence unit. And we print, it, print, print this out uh, recently. It's like a climate chart. Red and more kind of reddish colors mean that countries that is nurturing the talent better than the other ones. So blue or cooler colors represent the countries that is nurturing people not as well as those countries. Still, there is a huge gap here, as you can tell. Developed countries are doing a better job than rapidly developing countries. And you can see the ranking on the side. I mean, I'm not sure how clearly you can see it, but Korea is ranked number 13. Good thing is we are ahead of Japan. But you know, it's uh, it's an interesting indicator to look at it. I, another thing that we are actually looking into is compare this to GDP growth and uh, you know ex expansion within the economic growth. But we'll probably come up with a better data. But we actually have gotten a great response from this for HR executives to understand and have a better global picture looking at our workforce. I talked about generation gaps before. Here's the four generations that we're looking at actually today. People that were born 1925 to 1942 is called silent generation. 90, 1943 to 1960, baby boomers. Then there's generation X and there's generation Y. What does that mean? I'm not sure, I mean, 
to be honest, for me, even if you ask me, what does four generations mean, how they are different? I won't have an answer for you until I actually look into this and we start to prepare a chart. So I'm going to give you something. I thought it was pretty interesting to do this. When you ask a question, what is email? The baby boomer's response is, one more thing I have to do, which means I don't want to do it, but I'm doing it. Generation X said, the best way to stay in touch. Generation Y, not nearly as good as instant messaging, which means they already moved on from email. So let's ask uh, these three generations, what is instant messaging? Baby boomer, another distraction popping up on my screen. Understand that? Generation X, a good and quick way to get things done. Generation Y, like breathing, something they cannot live without it. What is text message? Baby more say, wow, it's a, you know, for techie kids, meaning that I don't have to know. Okay. Generation X said, good for short messages because they might say, are you coming? Yes. Are you late? Yes. Or I am late. Or, you know, those kind of quick messages. Generation Y, what I do all day long. I'm not going to go on and on, I mean, you can read it, but this distinctively tell you that when you manage different generation of people in your work, workforce, at your company, you cannot just say the same thing, thinking that they're going to all understand and receive the message in the same way. Because to them, all these simple things mean different things. So you have to have a flexible mind to understand who you're dealing with. It's like this, as a, as a management company, as a portfolio manager, or even for your own stockbroker, if the guy doesn't know anything about the stocks they're telling you to buy, why would you use him? Or if you're asking some financial advisor to go ahead and say, look, I have house here, which is X, X and here's the stocks, here's bond I want to buy. When they actually don't understand what's sitting in your portfolio, you're not going to use them. It's the same challenge you're facing. Your asset is people. Your asset is talent. So you really have to understand what the talent means and how they are different. We can talk about acquisition management. I thought it was important to talk about retention. Because after all, when you hire people, you manage people and nurture and develop them, you want them to stay. Because you try it. And they, now they're becoming something actually useful and you have to retain them. Survey of 500 global organizations. 68% of people say retaining talent is far more important than hiring. Absolutely true. Over 50% are earned salaries and bonuses and stock options to retain people. Interesting, but it's true. Only 27% try to provide employees with advanced opportunities within their organization. That's why organizations are failing. Many companies continue to struggle with the retention because they rely a lot of money. Now, I'm going to show you a chart here where we need the work for talent, we need the employer of choice. Once you become an employer of choice, meaning that if all the people want to join and work for you, then all these things go go in a very, very easy task for you because people will come to you instead of you going to them. As you can see, companies culture and opportunity, they are the biggest part of the pie as an employee look at it. Money has to be there, it still takes you know, a huge chunk of the pie, but there is a lot more to it than that. A month ago, I had a chance to sit down with the CEO of a Korean security company in New York actually, with uh, his management team. It's very interesting much because actually I didn't know that a you know, <coughs> Korean security company can have that kind of vision and strategy looking into the United States. Very well understanding of the market, understand the difficulties and how to take kind of step-by-step -step approach. You know, one of the things I hear a lot from a lot of Korean companies coming to the United States and when I sit down with them, they think they can easily come to states and be successful from Korea directly just by opening an office. They talk about a lot of strategies, but they miss a lot of linkage. You know, for example, this CEO was telling me that they were, he, you know, his first plan of attack is opening up in Hong Kong. Interesting. That's why we to go. Because you have to win 
Asia first before you win globally. It was a great conversation until the, at the end of uh, end of conversation. One of his executive team members told me, by the way, do you think we can attract good people? I said, like, sure we can. You know, if we have a, you know, if there's a strategy. And then by the way, that executive said, you know, we hear a lot that we're not paying enough to recruit top talent for Wall Street. Mm, wrong thinking. And I actually spent the next two hours explaining to the, the executive in front of the CEO why that thinking is not right. Almost re-explaining this by chart. As I said, money is important. And you have to have resources pay for the performance. There got to be financial incentive to pay people. But what I'm what I'm seeing a lot, and a lot of companies, what they're failing at is not understanding how important the culture and brand you have to have as a company is important. I challenge you to that. After this session, if you go back to your company, you, you ask your CEO, or if your CEO, write down one, one statement, one sentence, asking what is our mission of company. Repeat that exercise with the, your number two, so your boss, or the people in your team, and see how many like, how many people might say you know all the uh, the same kind of message, same mission of the company. Because almost when you recruit someone, you probably natural answer is yeah, we all understand mission of our company. But even that simple exercise will tell you you're not on the same page, meaning that you have a lot to work for in terms of building your culture and brand. All the sex to that, one of the most profitable organizations. Globally. I mean, I'm a financial services guy, so I'm going to use Goldman as an example. Goldman become today what it is today because they pay a lot of people at a very high end of market. To be honest, when you do compensation study, Goldman doesn't pay people well until you make a partner. But what Goldman does well is that when you talk to Goldman people, they have such a pride in their franchise. Being a Goldman person is sometimes a dream of a college kid. They would work for Goldman for free. Many people say that. As a company, you have to develop the brand to win it, win the war of talent. Since this is an HR forum, I was trying to kind of close this uh, presentation with something that's meaningful to a lot of HR executives uh, sitting here, or CEOs and, or, or managers of business. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, human resource management is the key to the future. This talent management, the assessment and long-term planning of a company's workforce needs, rather than a traditional filling vacancies, will become a key differentiator of companies competing in global markets. As I said, it's a proactive HR management. That's one thing that I, if I can, if you, if you walking out here not remembering anything I said. It's the only one thing that I want to put in your mind is proactive HR management. The relative importance of people concerns for executive leadership, acquiring talent has moved up the priority that layer. Better of the companies in the last three to four years of presently, it's it's it is it is the foremost now that is becoming on the mind of top executive and companies. All the HR management people still, I think, globally I experience this when I go to Hong Kong, Singapore, London, Paris, Milan, or New York, wherever I am, there's, I run into a lot of HR executives still thinking in the traditional mindset, not understanding how important their task is. I beg you today, actually, even for as a country, what you do as an HR executive or HR management can actually make the difference for the whole country. Comparing our advantage of a country will now be more dependent on creating and nurturing and attracting the best available talent. I was in Sweden once earlier this year. And that was the second time I went to Sweden. Uh, before it was about six years ago. First time I went to Sweden, one thing I realized that people looked at me weird because I'm an Asian. I have dyed for hair. When you go to Sweden, everyone has brown hair, blue eyes looking perfectly like models okay, that we see on the uh, Western magazines. <coughs> when I went to Sweden this year, earlier this year, things have changed. So I asked people, what happened here? Why do I see so many different colored people in Sweden? 
they said Immigration Act has changed. They realized that uh, just supporting Swedish workforce with Swedish national is over. There's no babies. They haven't produced a lot of workforce. So they actually changed their Immigration Act, allowing dual citizenship to open up the door. And actually, Sweden, Sweden's GDP is constantly growing, and they said the quality of their competitiveness is improving. That's not just Sweden issue. I mean, I've seen this phenomenon in Canada, as we all know, Australia, New Zealand. As a country, they're supporting what the company is supposed to do better. But, as I said, the ones who is going to make a difference is the human resource management executives. This is what I, I want to just uh, conclude my presentation with one quote. And this is actually, um, uh, one CEO told me this, and I thought it was very interesting, so uh, I want to use this today. Great leaders figure out what they can control, put all their energy against controlling those things. Tough times help you to figure out how to do great things in new ways. The reason I want to end up my pres end my presentation actually with this quote is because we, when it comes to the HR issue, we all know what we can control. That's the talent. That's the employees you have. Now, all you got to do is put all your energy against controlling those means and make it better. Deal with it. That's something you got to do right now and to make yourself that is more competitive and more efficient company in the market. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. The questions I will receive in Korean. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah. Yeah. There are about 22 indices that are incorporated. Um, I actually asked our team that put together those indices, and they said that the difference between Korea and Japan is that uh, Japan still has a strong trend towards lifetime employment, and when they asked the Japanese employees, the answer uh, regarding that particular indicator was negative. So when they created that index, they looked at about 22 factors. And if there was a low score in at least one of them, it would bring down the overall average. And I think that's why. Yes. Hello, I'm Chang Sung-ho, journalist with the uh, Korea Economic Daily. I was born in Korea and I graduated from university in Japan and I'm currently a journalist here in Korea. And when I compare the companies in Korea and Japan, um, I think maybe they are ranking higher than us. And I wonder uh, if there are any case examples of how Korean uh, conglomerates are attracting talents. Well, it's difficult for me to say which company is doing well and which is doing bad. It's a sensitive issue to be publicly mentioning company names. Uh, but maybe I could mention one particular case. I was in Japan a few days ago, and like I said, because my clients are mostly in the financial sector, I was able to meet many financial executives. And personally, I was very surprised. The fact that they were trying to acquire uh, Lehman's, there was a lot of investment on their side. If I go in depth, um, Lehman Brothers 
well, if I could share another story, it was it was Friday um, at five o'clock in the afternoon, and Paulson, uh, the Ministry of the Treasury in the U.S., he uh, gathered a meeting and executives from Morgan Stanley, uh, from Merrill Lynch, everyone was there, but there was one person that was not there. Uh, Dick Ford, the CEO of Lehman Brothers, was not there because he was busy. And on that day, th many things had happened. Then the next day, Saturday, all of the executives of Lehman Brothers w were not present. They had all been called back to their office. So they had gathered together in their offices discussing what to do. And then there was the CEO of Barclays uh, saying that they had al almost completed the deal with Lehman's. And then on Sunday, especially in New York, everybody had been packing their bags, being ready to glow. I was actually there at the Lehman's Brothers buildings. I wanted to meet some of my friends. I wanted to see what was going. And what I felt during my discussion uh, was, well, I don't know if you have been there in the New York uh, Lehman Brothers building. It's a, it's a wonderful building. And when J.P. Morgan acquired uh, a, a company, they did that because they wanted the building itself. Jamie Diamond uh, publicly said that he wanted the building and that's why they acquired the company. But Barclays did not say that. They said, we don't need the building. We don't want the building of Lehman Brothers. What we want is their bonds because they are the superior company even in the trading system. But what they said was, we don't need bonds, we don't need the trading system, but what we want is, we want the 250 executives of Lehman Brothers. And they said, we don't want the deal unless we have all of the executives. So, and no Nomura in Japan went one step further. Nomura of Japan is very, uh, is, is a visionary when it comes to pursuing people, uh, human resources. And they, Barclays ac actually offered more than Nomura, and they had individual interviews with all of these people. And I felt that there is so much to learn. Um, you asked about some case examples in um, conglomerates here in Korea. I mentioned that I met a CEO of a Korean securities company in New York, and he had a lot of fresh ideas. He had a lot of pioneering thoughts, and he also had many realistic solutions up his sleeve. But what I felt was that there was a bit of difference between his approach and that of Japanese companies, especially when you think of Nomura in Japan. I realized that Korean companies don't know themselves yet. They perform well, of course, and they are good when it comes to following market trends, but even though they say that they want to do this and that and pioneer new ways, they aren't good at doing so. I personally uh, don't know all Japanese companies because I only know the handful of clients that I have in Japan. I'm not an expert, but I do feel that in Japan, it takes such a long time for them to decide things. They will discuss things uh, forever, for years. But once a decision is made, they move very proactively and are very aggressive in the investment and the execution. So once a decision is made, I think that they are much more speedy compared to the companies in Korea. Of course, this is this all com comes from my personal experience, but that's the overall impression that I got. Hello, I'm Kim Jin Sung from KT Consulting. We're having some technical difficulties. Please bear with us. Sorry. Uh, 
Interpretation cannot be provided because we are having technical difficulties. The microphone is not working. So I wonder why the top management is being changed so often. Yes, well, that's a very good question. I want to give you some uh, comparative data rather than me giving you a conclusion. If you go to India, the turnover is eight months. Well, the CEOs, that is, wherever the industry. And they, they don't stay there for more than 10 months. But if you go to Hong Kong and Singapore, that's not the case. Also, in China, you can see that there's a turnover about uh, one or two years. What I want to say is when a company, um, a European or a Western company, comes to Korea, it takes some time to set up their operations. And when I was in the Seoul market in 1996-1997, and looking back on that time, I think that I worked with a lot of foreign companies, and they had a lot of trouble because they would open up their uh, offices here in Korea, and they went through a lot of trouble finding someone to head that office. I think the market has now matured, but that stage back then was, um, it was kind of a growing pains. And I think the employers themselves went through a lot of trial and error. Then why? do these executives leave? Why are they uh, dismissed from the company? If they had done a good job, of course, that would have not happened. But I think one factor is that the company does not have a good understanding of the Korean market, the local market. And as that improves, I think the CEO's tenures increase. Um, it also depends on which period you look at. Where do you take the data from? Um, if you look at the Korean securities market, the stock market, there's such a lot of uh, volatility. Things go up, things go down. So I don't think it's fair to say that the CEO turnover is short. It depends on which period you're looking at. Well, I am Kim Byung Sung from Samsung Securities. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. And uh, you mentioned that you are working for the financial services. So let me ask you this question: because of the financial crisis these days in the U.S., the IBs and a lot of financial institutions are now in trouble. And I believe that there must be a lot of uh, talent movement in the U.S. right now. So let's say for Korea companies, for them to globalize, I believe that global talent acquisition will be very important. So looking at this context, then, how do you believe that for Korean companies to take advantage of the current situation, maybe? Well, first of all, well, from our perspective, whether it's Korean securities companies or well, there is this tier two that we define. So the tier one would be Goldman Sachs, uh, Citibank, Morgan Stanley, Lehman used to be there, no longer, of course. So anyways, a lot of tier one companies were hit. And uh, for them, it will be very difficult 24 months lying ahead. They still have a lot of work to do. They still need to take care of a lot of things. So in 2009, it will be more difficult than 2008. And uh, so whether 2009 will be better, I doubt that. But 2010 will probably be a lot better than 2008. Now then, for tier one companies, so the, I mean, they were hit quite a lot by the market. And maybe because they had a big asset size, big balance sheet, I mean, they had a lot of exposure. They had a lot of credits and lending problems. So they were hit quite a lot. But for tier two companies, we believe that the tier two would actually be at the forefront next year. Standard Chartered, 
BNP Paribas. So these companies, I mean, you have maybe heard of somewhere, but I, we believe that now they will become the leaders next year because their balance sheet is very strong. I mean, they didn't really lend out all that much because they didn't have that much money. And also their rating is quite good. I mean, in the past, they didn't really think double A, single A didn't look so good. But, I mean, before there was triple A's, but now, I mean, double A, single A is very good. So if it's double A, then, I mean, people would just go for it. So I believe that this is something that you will see in Seoul next year as well. But I believe that these companies will continue to take a more share in the market. And I say the same thing to these companies. And uh, I would like to make the same advice to the Korean companies, which is that next year, including the Korean companies, for the tier two companies, this will be the biggest opportunity in decades. And if they lose out in the opportunity next year, then they will just remain as second tier. Now then, how can you capture that opportunity? Well, Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, well, what he said is that the where the storm is coming next is, well, of course, I mean, he may be replaced because now with the new president, but he said that the eye of storm is the compensation, the executive compensation. So he said that he's going to control the compensation for the executives. So for all the companies, for all the companies that are getting their bailout fund, they have to submit the data. And the cutoff line was $250,000. And actually, if you go to Lehman Brothers, and then most of them would get at least $300,000, meaning that the government is going to control most of the payments going to these people in the financial institutions. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because, well, at least this year, tier one companies, the competition is not going to be that good. I mean, unless you have extraordinary performance, their, perform their compensation will not be that good. So we believe that our prediction is that maybe 50% of last year's compensation that they received. And of course, it's too early to tell, but so I am reluctant to actually make, you know, share this, but since I'm here, let me just say this, but personally, I believe that it would, could be less than 50% because they're not making any money. Nobody's making money, so they cannot make such payments to their employees. So if that is the case, then you are able to acquire these talents at much lower compensation. I mean, you said that you're at Samsung Securities. So Samsung, it's a global company. Everyone knows this company. So now let's say Samsung Security is going to take the next leap. Then I believe that you would have a competitive advantage because, well, you were not in the market before, but now you're entering this market. And then all these talents are cheaper. And also, people would come to Samsung Securities because you're still standing, you have survived, as different from Lehman Brothers. So now then, as I mentioned, this is the biggest opportunity in a decade. Now then, what do you have to do in order to make the best of this opportunity? You have to focus on your corporate culture, brand. And of course, what is unique to Korea may be most suitable to Korea, that may be true, that may be correct. But on the other hand, if you are going global, then of course you have to keep true to your roots. But also at the same time, global mindset is different. So you have to remember that a global mindset has to be different from your traditional mindset. So as long as you have the kind of mindset, then maybe I do believe that you will be able to make a competitive bid. And for Nomura Securities, well, yes, this is a well-known company. Nomura Securities also has a long history in the U.S. And let's say if you ask 10 prominent economists in the U.S., then seven would say this. In the market, there is not much money going around. The capital is illiquid. So there is less liquidity in the market. And there are only a few sources where you can get this liquidity. One of them is Asia. So if you consider this, then, well, Samsung Securities, Nomura Securities, so whenever 
if you plan to expand next year, then, well, I'm sure you will do well, but uh, I believe that you will be able to take advantage of this market. You will be able to rise when everyone else is falling. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just want to ask a very brief question. Uh, acquiring and retaining and succeeding. Um, if you want to do that, I think an important issue is assessment. Do you have a uh, general method of assessment that you use in this process? Well, if you come to our company, you would think that we would give you a manual on uh, how to actually find talents, but that's not the case. Uh, we think that spending time, investing a lot of time uh, is important to come up with a tailor-made solution for a company so that you can have a hiring decision system and a decision process, an assessment tool that fits that company. That is our main methodology. I don't know which company you represent. Where are you with? I'm with uh, Taiwan CNC, a securities company in Korea. Yes, well, if you had come, if you can't come to us, we would maybe help you in developing a succession plan or so. But if we don't know your company, we won't be able to give you the correct uh, feedback or the methods. Um, we can't give you a textbook, and you know that elementary school students don't even follow the textbooks anyway. So it's best, better to find your own way. And in order to do that, we have to go there to see what you are doing and to really understand what com kind of company you are. Uh, and it would take about maybe a full two hours to touch upon even one part of that question that you asked. So one thing I really want to underline here is if you don't know what you want, you can't find your personal happiness. That's the same for an individual and also for a company. You have to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. You have to know what you want. And if you don't understand that, if you don't have a grasp for that, you won't be able to find the right people. And even if you find talented people, you don't know how, you wouldn't know how to use them. For instance, if you um, buy a sports car, it wouldn't be of any use if Korea had a really a ridiculous speed limit. So no matter how talented the people are, um, they won't be of any use. You won't be able to leverage them properly until you know what kind of company you are and what you want. So I think that's the takeaway. Well, thank you for coming at such an early time. Thank you. <laughs>